uh, this is all a flashback for me in the sense that I was uh, in an artist collective in New York back in the 60s called USCO. And uh, we made a big deal about uh, paying close attention to engineers and scientists and making it part of the work that we were doing and all that cool stuff, mm -hmm. as if we were inventing that. And you know, the reality is that art and technology be in, in each other's armpits for a long time, from Leonardo on. Um, the Media Lab was basically where I worked for a while. It was based on the idea of jamming art and technology together. Burning Man is based on the idea of throwing art and technology out in the desert and raining on them, seeing what happens. And so that these guys have gone to the screaming edges of both what's going on with art and what's going on with specifically web technology is in keeping with a very long tradition. And I guess that's part of what makes this a long now event. Uh, artists have embodied the, as they say, uh, long-term unconscious of humanity, and they probe, as McLuhan pointed out, into the future harder and faster and smarter than anybody. So please welcome John Hippolito and Jolene Blais. Thank you, Stuart. And uh, we're very excited to be here, Jolene and I. We're going to uh, go in a direction, uh, hopefully the future, as all Long Now projects seem to eventually, uh, emphasis on eventually, uh, that might be a little different from what you're used to in the sense that we're going to talk about art on the edge, but with a particular slant about our opinions of art on the edge and why it's on the edge, why we need it on the edge, and what it does for us. Jolene, if you want to get started. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here speaking with you um, in this particular context, the long now. And we tend to be thinking about the future in the long now. And I'm going to spend a moment talking a little bit about the past because the long then is also important too. Um, I'm going to revert back to ceremony, which is where I come from right now. To, and I'm going to say who I am, where I come from, and to greet the people of this place and the spirits of this place, which is a ceremony from the people that I'm from. My people are French and they're also Algonquin. The French people have been on this continent in the Northeast for over 400 years. Uh, or, and the Algonquins, of course, have been there for over 10,000 years. And so this is where I come from. I'm on the edge of two different cultures, and you will hear that a little bit in my presentation today. So I want you to know something about where I come from. I'm also a mother with young children and very interested in surviving the futures in front of us and having them survive in those futures. Um, so that's where I come from, and I also want to greet the spirits who have been here for over 10,000 years and to, to recognize that we stand in a place that has had life for that long. Um, today, as we gather here to speak in the homelands of the Ohlone Costanoan people, whose forebears have lived here for at least 10,000 years, our foreign technological cultures have brought us in a very short time period to empire collapse and global ecological catastrophe. Like many previous moments in geological upheavals and transformation, we are perched on the knife edge between annihilation and survival. Like the creatures of the Paleo-Proterozoic period, when eukaryotes churn deadly oxygen gas into the atmosphere of oxyphobic life, we must change or die. Our question today is whether artists can tip the balance towards survival. We believe, John and I, that with proper support, art is uniquely positioned to push us out of the Cenozoic era, era that we currently inhabit into the ecozoic era in which bottom-up networked systems can help regenerate the life that our inappropriate technologies so easily trample and supersede. Acting along the patterns of nature found in our own bodies, specifically the antibodies of our immune system, art appears to be one of our best technologies for surviving peak oil, market crash, and accelerating species extinction. But how does art do this? 
In thriving indigenous cultures, all beings, including humans, exercise this power. In Euro-American cultures, especially in so-called democracies, we nervously narrow this privilege to artists. Still, we can recall many historical examples of artists wielding this power. Shelley called poets the unacknowledged moral legislators of their age. Pound called them, quote, the antenna of the race. But while the Pintupi of Australia grant each family the power and responsibility to co-create the universe in each generation as they re-sing their song lines, Euro-ethnic cultures have rarely accorded artists direct influence outside the galleries and museums. Jericot and Picasso had to be content with painting representations of the Medusa or Guernica rather than taking part in historical incidents or generative creation of the world. In our age, the death of the artist and the slashing of public funding for the arts has narrowed that vocation even more. It's no wonder, then, that many creators have abandoned the term artist for more influential vocations. Vito Acconci of the Benetton advertising campaign changed his job description to designer, and Brenda Laurel, the game designer, some of you may know, changed hers to culture worker while Alexei Shulgin told artists to, quote, forget the very word, uh, very word and notion art. And then there were the countless artists who, during the dot-com boom, gave up their unlikely quest for fulfillment in the art world to join what turned out to be just as unlikely quest for fulfillment as creatives in e-commerce and game companies. As you can see, the West has been very good at convincing its humans to give up their own powers in favor of the machines, both industrial and corporate, that can do the work for them, or tell them how to do it. Of course, the problem with handing over your power so readily can be measured in a culture addicted to entertainment, caffeine, alcohol, and antidepressants, a culture that resigns itself to the corporate person's ideology that humans are unredeemable and destined to exterminate themselves which, for the outset, looks very good to the machines that do not calculate their dependence on us. Oops. <laughs> In the meantime, of course, and outside the fairy tale of mass media, indigenous peoples, local communities, and internet artists are reclaiming their sovereignty and their attendant creative powers. Ingenuity erupting far from art studios and galleries has started to take on a function that's looking more like art. Among the digital artists we survey in our book, At the Edge of Art, creative people are typing lines of self-replicating self software. They're splicing genes at lab benches. And they're rigging makeshift Wi-Fi networks. And they're, in doing so, reshaping our culture's vision of itself. Although they apply new techniques like polymerase chain reactions and PHP, <clears throat> they choose not to subordinate their work to the political and economic imperatives governing their colleagues in scientific or media industries. Instead, they wield these powerful tools and might, might best be described as an artistic bent, one whose influence extends far beyond the conventional confines of art, leveraging the internet to infiltrate stock markets, to sway court cases, and to network bedrooms. Note that with this reclaiming of creative power comes an insistent on the f insistence on the full range of creative power. Not satisfied with mere representation, this generation of creatives seeks real power in the world, the power to play, the power to create, the power to challenge and subvert real world structures. This is not representation. This is engagement, or in our terms, executability. This is the real creative economy, and it belongs to the people, not the corporations that have always sought to colonize this potential to enrich their current versions of the East India Company. Well, the pirates are back. And like the originals who were often escaped natives and slaves, they have come to reclaim their full sovereignty. So uh, we talked a little bit about what we see art's purpose, um, and now we're going to talk a little bit about how art goes about doing that. 
Because how do you reclaim sovereignty um, in the history that Jolene described of it basically being taken away from us? And specifically, the most creative people are probably the people we should be looking to to see how to do it. We in the book discuss lots of examples from game art to autobiography, from community building to political design. But today we're going to focus on two particularly potent symptoms of the powers wielded by artists of the internet age. And um, you'll see from their names uh, of these symptoms why Plato was so keen on banishing poets from his republic. The two powers are perversion and execution. So uh, perversion, artists have always been perverse in their way, right? So Caravaggio paints uh, the virgin uh, as a prostitute um, on her deathbed, hires a prostitute as a model. That's a pretty perverse thing. Uh, today we have Chris Ophelia making uh, Virgin Marys out of uh, elephant dung. But uh, that's sort of a perversity that's uh, you know, purely kind of prurient or, or sexual maybe, and that's not quite what we mean by perversion in our book. Digital and genetic techniques give artists the ability to automate perversion. So if you're scared by regular perversion like Caravaggio, then you should really be scared about automated perversion. Artists who wield these tools can summon forth entire universes of unlikely forms with a few strands of DNA or a few strokes on the keyboard of generative code. Um, Colleen, you want to mention well, One John example Simon? is uh, John Simon's Every Icon. Now, this is an artwork that began in um, nine, uh, 2001 or 2002. It, here 1997. It is. I wow, 1997. That, okay, yeah. uh, we can't see the top of this. It's still going on. Okay. And if computers last for the next uh, 100 trillion years, it will still be going on. This is a very long now artwork. It just lasts a long time. And the artwork is very simple. Uh, you can see it's been, it's the little uh, boxes um, shuffling. This is an algorithm that will actually generate every possible icon that can be generated in a 32 by 32 square. So at one particular point, your face will flash by this or something that looks like your face. <laughs> you might not be there to see it, but uh, it will be there if it can be represented in a 32 by 32 icon. So um, this is one example of the very strange and powerful kind of artwork, an artwork that can span huge amounts of time, assuming the technology can keep pace with it. So um, I also wanted to mention a project by Jody. Some of you who have familiar with artists on the internet, they're sort of the, uh, uh, I don't know, the dynamic duo or poster children of, of uh, the internet age. And um, they're best known for projects that um, really kind of screw around with you. Uh, for example, if you go to oss.jody.org, um, you will see something like this. Uh, burp, 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 burp. This a project usually crashes your computer, so it's kind of scary to do this in a presentation. Hey, something's <laughs> wrong with the projector. What happened? Uh, so this is actually a rather old project it's from, um, oh, 1999, something along that, some, something, something in the late 90s. And um, we're per fairly familiar with pop-up uh, ads by now, but uh, the artist got there first. They actually uh, created a website that creates these um, insanely... Uh, manipulating and, and sort of proliferating uh, pop-up windows. And if you ever try to uh, close them, it's just uh, impossible. So it reminds me of that woman in Vermont who was facing 40 years in prison for, uh, for accidentally launching a porn site while 12-year-olds were watching and being unable to click all the pop-up windows <laughs> from stopping. Um, I should also say that uh, Dirk uh, Pacemans, who, um, who uh, is one of the Jody uh, folks, told Jolene and I that his favorite occupation when he goes to a new city is to look for those Apple stores, those great big white beautiful uh, buildings where you're basically walking a white cube with a row of you know, 24 iMacs. And he goes up to each one, and of course they've got you know, internet access there. All of them. Right. And he just <laughs> he you know, goes to one side on after another, and he sits back and watches <laughs> while this white cube becomes filled with these crazy black, black rectangles. And very soon afterward, filled with Apple tech people trying to figure out what the hell happened to their <laughs> safari. So the only way actually to get out of it is to force quit. So I will do that now. Kill process. Uh-oh. Thank you. Little computer. Okay, back to uh, regularly well, scheduled What's programming. important about this project is that we get the sense, like as when we play video games, that we somehow are in control when we you know, launch our computers and our browsers and we make the machines do what we want them to do. And I think Jody was really interested in showing us that 
we don't always have the kind of control that we think we do, and when we lose control, we get very nervous. That whole moment of who or what's in control, and the sort of waking up out of that trance that we're in charge of what's happening with our technology, I think is really important. So, um, okay. that's one so, piece we really uh, One other example, um, a little more <coughs> in control, perhaps, but just as, as sort of, um, of, of, of perverse in the sense of being autom be able to automate many multiple strange kinds of forms, the kind of polymorphous perversity that Freud talked about, is Ken Musgrave's uh, Planet Moho. This is a, uh, those of you who know um, that uh, sometimes fractal uh, algorithms from mathematics are used to create, for example, scenes in, you know, waves in the Titanic or, or uh, mountain tops in an alien space in, uh, movie. Um, Ken actually did this, a lot of the software, Bryce, that produces that, but he also, for fun, uh, made a, uh, essentially a planet generator that anyone could use and create these uh, planets on their own. And it's really nifty sort of interface that allows you to, to manipulate, um, you know, essentially terraform your own world very quickly uh, and, uh, and uh, with enormous potential for variety uh, with basically operating on the generative code of algorithms like fractals. Um, and then he created a sort of transporter. So within the Moho world universe, you can basically transport to each other's planets and everyone can kind of create their own. Uh, so that gives you some sense of the, um, of the kinds of, uh, of, of, of tools that are available to artists and the ways that they can generate forms quickly. Sometimes, as in the case of Ken Musgrave, they're operating just from sort of, you know, some basic formulas. In the case of artist uh, Mark Napier, he just works from any given web page. And his project is called The Shredder, um, which I will launch. I think, oh, here, I have it. Okay. So, um... One of the We're distinctions the between these two projects is that when you see Ken Musgrave's work, you don't know what's under the hood. You see the pretty worlds being formed, and you see the mountains changing, and you see the skies, and you see the rivers forming, but you don't really know what's causing that change. You move a few buttons. Now, he knows because he's a programmer, and he knows what's going on behind the hood. Mark Napier's project, Shredder, shows us what's going on, on under the hood with Internet uh, web pages. So he basically takes a page and shreds it and turns the web page inside out so that you can actually see the HTML tags, the JavaScript, um, the other things that are behind the scene. Now, some of you who go to view source will see that anyway, but those of you who don't uh, can, uh, can see some of it in Mark Napier's pages. My students, inspired by this work, actually create narratives in which you're going through a web page and reading a narrative, and at one point, one of the clues or one of the pieces of the story is actually in the source code. So you have to actually go into the source code to get part of the story, part of the narrative. So my students are actually learning to get under the hood and, and find out uh, where the coding is happening, which is, I think, where the real generative power for this kind of art uh, is happening. So this is the uh, just Long Now site, of course. And, um, mm, let's shred it. Let's shred it. <laughs> so I'm just typing, typing in any bookmark you want. And uh, whoa, whoa, what's going on? Okay. So uh, what you see now is uh, the Long Now website turned inside out. So what was big is small, uh, what was small is big, what was hidden was shown, and what was shown is hidden. And uh, this is a fairly not that difficult to do. Internet art isn't always about like, achieving something that's technically very difficult, but it's lots of fun because you can mess around with people's pages and see all kinds of things they didn't intend. Every time you shred the site, it looks differently. So uh, again, it's not so much making a single image as much as it's making a way of making multiple images. Now, actually, Mary Flanagan has an interesting version of this, which can play on your own computer, on your own hard drive, and actually turns that inside out as well. And she thinks of it as the unconscious of the, not so much the unconscious of the machine, but some kind of unconscious that the user has put there. Because what happens is it starts to mix your photographs with the songs that you listen to, with your email to your cousin or your mother or your old lover, and that comes up next to a song about, you know, and so all these things start to mix up in this director kind of file. And so she's sort of revealing all those things, you know, for the computer, what Freud revealed in his sort of psychoanalysis sessions. You know, what's underneath there that gets hidden and repressed and put away? And, and what does it feel like when it comes back up to the surface? And how do our machines begin to represent who we are? And what does it mean to look under there uh, and see? So um, if you're interested in that, Mary Flanagan's phage is something to uh, look at as well. MaryFlanagan.com is where you can find her work. Uh, F-L-A-N-A-G-A-N, Flanagan. Shall I do execution? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, the other uh, symptom we were going to talk about for art, apart from perversion, is execution. And execution, um, in this sense, 
is uh, a potent technique for distributing work if perversion is the 21st century artist's most potent technique for creating new forms. To execute, of course, is what we say in computers when you're running a program. You know, you launch a word processor or a spreadsheet. But the, mean can, uh, the term can be extended to mean triggering an existing system to discharge a task that changes the state of the system. Okay, that's a really like, general, boring definition. But what executable art does is hijack today's computational systems, legal systems, economic systems, and in those networks, it propagates outside the studio or the gallery to affect distant people and events. So um, in one example that you see in the, in the image at upper right, uh, Joe Davis, uh, a, a biotech artist, hijacks the reproductive system of E. coli, the bacteria. He draws a picture in its DNA, and then he unleashes this info gene, basically an, an image embedded in uh, DNA, encoded in DNA, I should say, into the natural ecosystem. Uh, the Yes Men do something uh, different, Jolene? How many people here have heard of the Yes Men? All right. Have you seen the Yes Men video or just heard about them? Yeah, they, they do some high-class jinx. They started off uh, on the Artmark site, and uh, somebody um, asked them to um, do a website. They had got the domain name George W. Bush, uh, gw.bush.com, gw .com, and uh, apparently the Bush campaign hadn't got that yet. This was before the election. So they got the site, and they reproduced it with a few slight changes. And uh, the, of course, Bush people got very upset, and they sent cease and desist, and they told them to take it down, and, and yada, yada, yada. And they refused to, so of course, reporters came on the scene, and they asked Bush what he thought about this. And for some of you who've seen their movie, uh, Bush actually responds to this and says, well, these are garbage men. They're just doing garbage. And when he's pushed about whether or not they have the right to do this online, he says, well, there ought to be limits to freedom. That's when he actually made his famous statement, there ought to be limits to freedom, in response to reporters asking questions about the Yes Men website. So, um, so um, they've done a number of different pranks, and this is one of them that I've just showed my students the other day. Um, they put up a Dow Ethics website, uh, DowEthics.com. Dow had their own website, but they forgot Dow Ethics, because of course they don't think about ethics. So uh, the Yes Men uh, pulled it up, and uh, they, uh, they did a prank on the anniversary of the Bhopal uh, uh, catastrophe. And uh, they, uh, because they had a Dow Ethics website, um, I think it's MSNBC got in touch with them and um, did an interview with them. And during the interview, they basically apologized for the Bhopal incident and said that they were going to um, pay all the reparations for all of the injured uh, in this, and this went on MSNBC. It was broadcast worldwide. Everybody saw it. And of course, Dow was forced to then the next day say, well, actually, well, the first thing that happens, of course, the stock went down like, f what, four, four, billions of dollars, right? 4.2%. In 23 minutes, the stock went down after this came out. So this is like huge amounts of money. And so um, what Dow was forced to do is basically get back on the airwaves and say, we're sorry, but we don't apologize. <laughs> for all that injury, and uh, we're sorry, but we don't take responsibility for what we did, and we're sorry that we're not going to do any of the things that our so-called airsats representatives said we would do. So um, this is the, some of the pranks of the, of the yes men. It's, it's um, also kind of interesting when you, Jolene pointed this out to me, I've got the two oh, yes. uh, websites uh, side by side, and they, they added something to the, uh, yes, the real one. Yes, my students notice this. When I put these website, this is the Dow Ethics one, and um, the Dow website, very soon after the Dow ethics thing started to happen, they have under quick links, you'll see the first one is ethics. That didn't used to be there. And my, my students also said, oh yeah, aren't those, uh, aren't those the guy that do the HU, the human element campaigns? They've seen them all over TV. And they said, oh, and now we know why they're doing that human element commercial stuff, because they're trying to recover from that real embarrassment of not really caring about people. So I said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. So um, that's a bit of social uh, hijacking and um, also media hijacking. What happens with the Yes Men is they use, broadcast, they use uh, network media to get out a f kind of trick identity. Then they jump on the broadcast media and they announce their, their various... Um, um, 
They, they basically do what they call identity correction. They speak what should be spoken. They say the truth about what these people are supposed to be saying. So for example, in one case when they went to Australia, uh, representing the World Trade Organization, they actually disbanded the World Trade Organization. <laughs> the, the Canadian Parliament reported it in the middle of a parliamentary session. And they said they were going to restart the World Trade Organization along humanitarian lines with all of the regulations of the Human Rights Commission that the United Nations had put together. Now, of course, WTO had to do the same thing that Dow Chemicals did, which said, no, 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 we, we, we're not really interested in doing that. No, we really don't want human rights. That's not really what we're about. So very embarrassing. So uh, on the, um, on, on the, uh, on, on, unless the, pro, uh, well, in a different angle of uh, executability, quite literally, um, the yes men, of course, are, are people who intervene in politics even though they come from perhaps an artistic background. Here's someone who intervenes in art, if you will, even though he comes from a very different, uh, in this case, a, a kind of political, politicized um, computer scientist, if there is such a thing. Uh, there was a case against uh, the, um, the Hacker Quarterly 2600, which some of you may know. Uh, for uh, linking to code that allowed you to decrypt a DVD. So if you wanted to pirate the Pirates of the Caribbean, you'd use this code called DCSS. Of course, if you wanted to back up your disc of Pirates of the Caribbean, so in case your kid scratched it, you wouldn't be out 20 bucks or 30 bucks. You'd also have to use this technology. But the technology was illegal, uh, at least circumventing the DCSS was illegal under the Digi Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So linking to that code was, uh, was a reason for the uh, MPAA to sue the Hacker Quarterly. And in 2000, uh, a district judge named Lewis Kaplan uh, 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 issued an injunction saying, you have to stop that. Uh, you're, you're, you're linking to illegal code. Now, there was a computer scientist named uh, Dave Turetsky out of CM, uh, Carnegie Mellon who said, you know, something very odd about this. I'm a, I'm a computer scientist, and um, I, I write code all the time. And for me, code is a form of writing. It's a form of expression. It's an odd form of expression. It's a form of expression that a computer, I need a computer to help me interpret and, and, um, and uh, express, but I view it as a form of expression anyway. And when I was reading uh, Judge Kaplan's decision, he was struck by the fact that the judge, uh, the defense tried to say, well, you know, freedom of speech, First Amendment, and they said, judge said, no, 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 no. Um, computer code is not speech because it's executable. That's the difference. And uh, Kretretsky said, gee, I wonder if that's really true. Um, and he did a series of experiments that were basically artistic experiments in recreating that uh, DCSS code in a way that was uh, not exactly executable, but sort of executable. So it, um, he put a call out for uh, people who were interested in the issue, activists, computer scientists, artists, whatever, to contribute uh, variations on this DCSS code. And he got all kinds of versions in C and Perl and so forth. Um, the tiniest C implementation, that's kind of stuff that, uh, you know, computer scientists get into. But he also got odd stuff like this. This is the DVD logo rendered as DCSS code. And if you look up really close, you'll see that's what it is. But, you know, it's, um, it is a picture. And pictures, we know, are protected under uh, freedom of expression. So does that qualify? Well, uh, there were plenty of other examples, um, including um, uh, images uh, that weren't in ASCII, so they weren't immediately, you could scan them in character, recognize them, in which case they'd be executable, but ordinarily they wouldn't be. There were t-shirts. There was a haiku, a beautiful haiku, uh, telling you how to do it. There's the t-shirt and tie. A dramatic reading, well, okay, if, it's, if you read the code, is that executable? Uh, a Star Wars movie where the code uh, moved past the screen, a la the beginning of Star Wars. Um, and uh, anyway, lots of, lots of great stuff. And uh, as a result, um, the, um, this gallery, by, by, he also kind of chose this word, it terms, uh, to, to, to suggest an artistic 
context here. It's a gallery of CSSD scrambles. So as Jolene mentioned in the introduction, we have all these artists sort of fleeing the word artist and calling themselves designer and creative. What a hideous term, creative. I'm the creative of the dot-com company. And here we have a computer scientist saying, no, 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 I've got a gallery. I'm an artist. And, and in so doing, uh, uh, arguing that there's a slippery slope between executable uh, code and, you know, sort of quasi-executable visual audio, whatever culture. And as a consequence, uh, the, um, the, the, when the court came, decision came up in appeal, uh, I think it was the Second Circuit said, um, no, uh, this guy Turetsky is right. He came and he did his deposition and they said, we rule that, cor that code is a form of, of, of expression. It is analogous to speech. So here's an example where a bunch of artworks in a gallery changed a court case. And uh, do you want to talk about MetaMute? Yeah, um, a few weeks ago, I was actually speaking with um, Johannes Vogenhuber, who is the architect of the European Constitution. And uh, during that conversation, I said, so what do you think of Echelon? And uh, he just flew out of his seat and he said, we have a lot of trouble with Echelon. Now, Echelon is basically a kind of spy software um, that is used by the UK-USA agreement, basically Australia, Canada, New Zealand, UK, and the United States. And it's used in a number of contexts. He said, we have a big problem with this because we're really worried about spying on citizens. We're really worried about the power of this technology, spying on ordinary citizens. And so it turns out that the report that was launched by the European Parliament suggests that Echelon was capable, and I'm quoting now, of interception and contact and inspection of telephone calls, fax, email, and other data traffic globally through the interception of communication um, including satellite transmission, public switch telephone networks, and microwave links. This is a sort of vast kind of citizen spy uh, kind of um, project. So one of the ways that internet artists responded to this is to try to spam this, net, this, this kind of software. So what you do is you, you get a list of all the code words. So for example, terror, uh, nuclear, uh, bombs, uh, dynamite, uh, terror, you know, uh, Iraq, um, uh, there is some less obvious, but there's a whole list of code words that actually triggers the Echelon program to start snoo you know, snooping and spying on you. Of course, and there so are also words like dissent, you know, uh, uh, dissident, dissident uh, right. protest, uh, <laughs> activism, these are also code Feminism, words. Feminism, all those isms. Um, so, um, so what happened is they thought they would find the whole list of these code words and have lots and lots of people start sending random emails stuffed with all of these words just to, you know, uh, start a whole trail of like red herrings all over the place. And if you, if you jam it with enough false signals and they won't be able to spy on, on, uh, on people who are using maybe them legitimately in a regular email about their feminist course that's talking about uh, terrorism in, you know, Africa, whatever. So. Well, uh, that's, that's what happened, in fact. That's what happened. What, well, what happened is that this doesn't really work very well because Echelon was a little bit smarter than that, and it wasn't just picking up certain words. It was picking up words in context. It turns out that it had to be the right context, the right grammar. It had to sound like uh, what the program was designed to sniff as real terror messages, real you know, spy networks, whatever. And so um, Metamute, which was a, a magazine at the time, decided to launch a fiction writing contest. And they published the list of code words, or the sort of trigger words, and they said, we're going to give a $1,000 prize to the short story that includes the most number of code words used the most number of times, and yet is a very interesting short story. And they actually published these short stories uh, in their uh, Metamute Echelon edition, uh, which apparently was effective enough to trigger all kinds of interesting uh, excitement by the Echelon um, <laughs> software. Um, so one of the things that you can kind of uh, take from this is that you know, literature has always held the power to sway readers' hearts and minds. But executable literature literature that takes advantage of the networks that are out there, be they governmental or, or, uh, or electronic, can act directly on the infrastructure of power woven into the digital fabric of contemporary life. So if traditional literature produces satisfaction through catharsis, but leaves the world's injustices unchanged, this is a problem that Brecht and other people had about contemporary art, 
executable literature produces satisfaction through engagement, through acting directly on the world rather than standing back and somehow kind of representing that. So should I go into go antibody? All right. Um, so a lot of people have seen these powers of uh, art and said, gee, this is a lot like virus, a virus. In fact, in the case of the Jody piece that almost took over my screen, uh, they got booted from their ISP not long after launching it because it said, well, clearly you're forcing our viewers to download a virus. You know, it shows how much ISPs know about viruses, but it also shows a, a, a sense of the kind of uh, terror <laughs> that sometimes accompanies people when they see artists getting these newfound powers. And, um, you know, Andy Warhol said to have updated his prediction that everyone be famous for 15 minutes to the claim that in 15 minutes everyone will be famous. That was a variation on it. Well, um, either claim seemed pretty unrealistic in 1968, but um, in 2003, the advent of a Warhol worm, a virus that infected 90% of vulnerable computers within 10 minutes, put that fantasy within reach. Uh, and um, people like Oliviero Toscani, um, who uh, does very interesting uh, ads for companies that are nevertheless agitprop, sort of political issues, describes his work as a virus. He says, I am an artist, art is a virus, I'm a virus against um, you know, racism or whatever he's dealing with, like a commercial world. And it's tempting. Viral metaphor makes sense because viruses are perverse, they mutate, and they're executable. They hijack the host's means of replication to further their own proliferation or proliferation, depending on whether you're George Bush. Okay. However, <laughs> viruses originate outside a host organism, and they're interested in that host surviving only long enough to enable them to infect other hosts. Art, on the other hand, originates inside the host, right? And it's symbiotic with the larger body. It's long-term survival, and many people would say its meaning depends on the cultures that it either critiques or celebrates. So it's different. It's not a virus. Now, of course, a lot of artists aren't necessarily comfortable with being associated with society, uh, or at least with its status quo versions. They want to say, no, I'm off here. I've got my beret and my mustache, and I'm different. Um, in Western culture, the feeling's often mutual. <laughs> uh, but with rare, rare exceptions, like you know, Goebbels' book burnings and Stalin's poet purges, no Euro-ethnic society since Plato has really succeeded in booting artists out altogether. They're, they're a kind of social irritant, a fly in the grease. Uh, but they're part of culture along with village idiots, criminals, used car salesmen, and presidents. Art is an unruly, pesky, troubling symbiont. And that's because its task, like the task of the shaman, is to serve as a diversity agent, to alert us to otherness, and that otherness can be both a danger and an opportunity. Um, to do this well, like the shaman, the artist must scout what is unfamiliar, court what is foreign, and engage with what is not yet recognized. That's a daunting task. It's one for which Euro-ethnic cultures don't really offer an obvious model. The best metaphor for art's contemporary role may be a microbe, but one internal rather than external, the antibody. Now, why do I think that antibodies are like viruses, I mean, are, are like art. Well, the job of an antibody is to keep up with viruses. So it's not surprising that antibodies share many of the same powers as viruses, including perversion and execution. What are antibodies again? They're proteins dangling on these white blood cells running around your body. There's trillions of them in your bloodstream and lymphatic system. Each of them is a complicated organic molecule twisted in a funky shape, and each of them serves as a unique portrait of some particular foreign agent. Antibodies make reliable detectors of viruses and other foreign lumps of protein because for any given virus, there's gonna be only one antibody that exactly dovetails with it. Some small fraction are inherited from the womb, uh, the body makes the rest, but how do you make a cellular database of foreign dangers that you've never encountered. Here's where we're talking about the future. I mean, this is the future. This is your body predicting what it's gonna see before it's ever seen it. In other words, how does the body know what chicken pox looks like before it ever gets chicken pox under its skin? And the answer is a really interesting mechanism that biologist Gerald Edelman described as a genetic jumbler. 
Like everything else in a cell, the exact shape of protein dangling from a lymphocyte is determined genetically. But unlike the stable genes that are in, say, the nucleus or the membrane, the, the genes for a lymphocyte's receptor, that antibody, is prone to shuffle itself during cell reproduction. It's basically kind of a faulty genetic system. But the good part of this built-in randomizer is that each of these billions of lymphocytes initially produced by the body bears a different chemical lure on its surface. So even if a chicken pox virus has never got in your bloodstream before, there's probably a white blood cell in there already with a protein to match. That's how the immune system knows what a chicken pox cell, uh, virus looks like before it gets to you. Now, when the gene jumbler produces an antibody that looks too similar to the host's own body, the antibody is rejected as useless. Like the antibody, art that is too similar to the social body is also useless. At least we think so in the 21st century, when we really need to be thinking outside of ourselves to keep pace with all this stuff that's coming down the pike. If you want, uh, art, like antibodies, are diversity agents. Artists uh, online manipulate digital and social codes to make art the way the immune system manipulates genetic code to make antibodies. And like the immune system's polymorphously perverse antibody production, uh, it gives art a kind of quirky and, and prophetic vision. Uh, something that's unlikely to emerge from a bunch of think tanks and Rand trying to figure out what the future is going to bring, which is sometimes why they bring over like Hollywood writers and novelists and you know people, science fiction authors, to help them figure out what's coming down the pike. The misuse of genetic code, which might prove lethal elsewhere in the body, allows the immune system to anticipate shapes it's never encountered. Artists similarly are wrong-headed. They misuse computer, genetic, social codes to reveal the ways in which society is being shaped by new technological and political forces. Well, okay, that's the perversion side. What about the execution side? And um, let me, uh, yeah. Uh, when it comes to executing code, especially the DNA that controls their reproduction, white blood cells are trigger happy. If any of these uh, proteins ever connects with something that actually fits, that is like you've got a, uh, an antibody that matches chickenpox and actually comes in contact with something that looks like chickenpox or is chickenpox, the match turns that lymphocyte into a chemical warning beacon. It just alerts everything in its area, and given it's in the bloodstream, pretty soon the whole body knows about it. Even more importantly, that activated light blood cell does the sort of microbial equivalent of going into heat. It just makes an incredible number of copies of itself. And I have the statistics here. A stimulated lymphocyte creates new antibodies at the rate of 10,000 molecules per cell per second. That's 10,000 per cell per second. And that creates a systemic change in the entire lymphatic and circulatory system. So at the beginning of an infection, your bloodstream may contain only a handful of antibodies to counter uh, chickenpox. But afterward, within a few days, billions of chickenpox antibodies are flowing through your bloodstream. So to execute again, in the world of genetic or computer code, means to turn the potential power of instructions into the actual power of behavior. But there's a lot of codes at play in both immunological and social bodies. The immune system executes its code when it recognizes invasion of the body by foreign code, like a virus. Digital art executes its code when it recognizes invasion of the social body by codes that appear foreign or harmful, whether they're cultural, legal, or, or social. However, there's a little more complication to that. Uh, and Jolene, I think you want to go into on the edge. So it would seem from what John just said that antibodies and viruses operate by comparable mechanisms, and they do. Um, and then maybe they just happen to be on opposite sides of the skin or blood barrier. Um, but they have a more important difference than that, than location. And that is antibodies are part of a larger ecosystem, uh, the ecosystem of your body to which they are accountable, while viruses are accountable only to themselves. This makes antibodies a much more interesting metaphor for art of the Internet age. Um, antibodies work in a network of life. They are mechanisms for envisioning and populating the body with alien forms. In other words, they occupy a liminal space between self and other, not entirely under the control of either. Basically, you could say they surf the immune network. 
So in order for antibodies to maintain this function, they need to maintain their independence. So they are not subservient to any kind of top-down command and control system from the body. That was the old view of how the immune system works, but a Nobel Prize winner actually uh, has suggested that the immune system actually works much more like a network, which is a very interesting way of thinking about it. Um, and it turns out that this network is not a top-down system, but rather a bottom-up bottle, that it works by selection rather than by instruction. The bone marrow produces a million varieties of antibodies, 99% of which um, will never serve the body at all. Um, it's only when an antibody courses through the bloodstream and it happens to match up um, a foreign antibody that it reproduces wildly and counters the pathogen's invasion in the short term, and it lingers in the bloodstream as somatic memory in the long term. This somatic memory in the bloodstream, we think, is like cultural memory in the social body. Artists produce the kind of effect, a system change, that produces a kind of cultural memory that we remember in the larger social body. So similarly, we don't think that the NEA should have a top-down approach to artists either. Um, that they should uh, tell what artists should paint or code or write. Like the B cells and the immune system's front line, artists are better positioned than any centralized establishment to spot and confront pressing cultural issues, whether they're technological, like gene harvesting, or legal, like music piracy, or personal, like online intimacy. Dispersed across scientific labs and virtual communities and street corners rather than cosseted in studios and concert halls, artists represent a kind of grassroots defense against the invasion of cultural memes. Of course, even a grassroots defense is still defense a truism that would seem to cast doubt on the immune system as a kind of metaphor for this newfound proactive power that art wields in the internet age. After all, isn't much of the motivation for art's eruption outside of galleries and museums, precisely to avoid the, ema the emasculation of power that attends its circumscription by the white cubes of art? Aren't today's creative thinkers targeting the stock exchange, global surveillance networks and restrictive copyright laws precisely because they think these are unhealthy institutions that need attacking rather than healthy institutions that need defending. Well, this is a reasonable objection, and to answer this requires a little bit more nuanced look at the immune system. It turns out that natural antibodies, like components of many complex adaptive systems, work to keep a system in balance with its entire environment, not just itself. No mammal would ever have evolved without some means of maintaining a balance of power between self and other, and over the past 500 million years, immune systems have endowed vertebrate metabolism with just enough stability for their populations to co-evolve into complex and variegated ecologies, internally and externally. For healthy organisms, um, this has often meant disarming malignant invaders, in the, as, for example, in the case of smallpox or malaria, but on some occasions, it means welcoming them into a relationship with the host. And as you probably know this, uh, mitochondria is a foreign uh, agent. It has different DNA than the rest of your body. And E. coli is also a foreigner that your body tolerates in some kind of symbiotic relationship. Um, so the other is also within, in many ways, and helps us to survive. This encounter with otherness is healthy for the entire ecosystem. It is not a colonial mission to diminish otherness outside the body. The immune system is the aperture, the valve that opens or closes the body to the rest of the microbial world, as art opens or closes the valve to the rest of the technological, political, social world. There are times, however, when the animal byproducts of evolution are unsustainable, when an organism's metabolism is out of balance with its environment, and perhaps shouldn't survive, at least in its current form. Indeed, sometimes the body defends itself all too well, at which point the immune system's mission of defending the body is no longer warranted. When the body's intolerance of otherness means that no aliens cross the skin barrier, when the flow of information across the immune aperture gets squeezed to a trickle, the immune system can turn on its own host. In biology, this condition is called autoimmunity. The organism quite literally no longer recognizes itself. And its antibodies challenge the body's own tissues instead of the foreign agents. In systemic autoimmune disorders like lupus, uh, the antibodies target the entire body. Uh, in um, 
um, in, um, in other autoimmune responses, they target specific other areas. For example, in psoro um, um, psoriasis, it's the skin. In uh, type 1 diabetes, it's the pancreas. Uh, in multiple sclerosis, it's the nerves. In rheumatoid arthritis, it's the bone joints. But interestingly, epidemiologists have noted an inverse relationship between infectious disease and autoimmune disorders. In cultures where smallpox or malaria is rampant, autoimmune diseases are rare, while in those with relatively, flu with relatively few external um, scourges, the immune system appears more likely to target its own host. It is as though the immune system expects a steady diet of otherness, of foreignness, from the external environment. And if it doesn't find enough otherness outside, it will actually turn inside to look for it. Now, contemporary human bodies are more or less stable products of evolution, so far, we think. Um, and cases of autoimmunity among human populations can result in tragic suffering, or at best, annoyance or discomfort. These are not very pleasant uh, situations. Um, but this situation is not as clear for our social body at the beginning of this 21st century, which by many accounts is wildly out of balance with its environment. From the overreach of corporate interests to the relentless proliferation of technology to the reckless provocation of global climate change and needs to be drastically readjusted. If this is true, then art can act as an antibody and still assault its own culture. Step back to view these diametrically opposed conditions, art as defender or art as attacker. Um, step back from a more expansive per, uh, perspective. The YesMensGap.org project, this is the project that got them an invitation to represent the WTO, um, uses the perversity of Reamweaver and um, the exe executability of the web's domain name system by basically buying up uh, Gat.org and posing as uh, WTO representatives. Um, so by using that domain name system, it undermines the credibility of the World Trade Organization, as, we've just, as I've mentioned before. Um, you could say that the yes men, that the WTO, that, that um, the yes men might say, for example, that the WTO is an internal menace contributing to an unhealthy social body. Or they could say that the WTO is an external threat to a healthy social body that it's a corporate giveaway that seeks to undermine a just society via unnatural technologies um, or unnatural economic controls. From the standpoint of coevolution of an organism with its environment, it ultimately doesn't matter whether a threat is internal or external. For systems far from equilibrium, the distinction between self and other breaks down anyways. What is important is how art goes about challenging these threats. So I'd like to talk for a moment about this double-edged character of antibodies and how art of the internet age has a similar double-edged character. It can defend or assail its host depending on the context. So uh, I think it's easy to get scared if you are in a position of power and you realize that all an artist has to do is register a domain name and they can sink your stock market price you know, overnight. But even when art challenges its own society, the accountability differs from the accountability of direct political action, uh, whether that's from the inside or the outside. Uh, a social body like a human body isn't just a, a, a free-for-all. It's a complex set of feedback mechanisms. And a political activist, whether her weapon is a pistol or a press conference, uh, with bad politics is going to wreak suffering and havoc on the world. Artists, on the other hand, have to be free to explore unconventional, untested, even dangerous values with impunity. So how do you let them do that? Well, you don't hand them a pistol. Um, if uh, anything, this makes artists more accountable than antibodies because they have to exercise care for the social body even when they attack it. In return for this artistic license that allows uh, a creator to explore risky themes, that creator has to take care to undermine rather than overpower, to impose questions rather than impose answers. And for its part, society has to come back and tolerate a perverse multitude of artistic inventions and directions, just like the biological body tolerates this perverse alien forms produced by antibodies. 
Like antibodies, the artists are an inefficient drain on the body's resources. Like antibodies, the arts are worth it. The job of an artist, like that of an antibody, is to conjure possible threats to that body, real or imagined. While this conjuring may not put the body directly at risk, nevertheless, reactionary impulses are likely to see these conjurings as more dangerous than they really are. Not just because they threaten life and limb, they often don't, but because they threaten something about the status quo. It's unjust or it's uh, uh, hidden by ideological blinders. Uh, but that's why the yes men call their work identity correction. In their words, honest people impersonate big time criminals in order to publicly humiliate them. Targets are leaders in big corporations who put profits ahead of everything else. All right. That's not to say artists can't do damage. So there is a kind of artistic license and an expectation of accountability. But the damage that art does stems from revelation rather than ruin. There's nothing artistic about uh, Union Carbide, which is the company that before Dow bought uh, it. Uh, secret decision to test unproven technologies at a gas plant in Bhopal. Okay, so 1984, 15,000 people died, hundreds of thousands injuries, nothing artistic about that intervention. But when the Yes Men hijacked that domain, Dow Ethics, to publicize the Earthsat's uh, apology, it wasn't just an innocuous prank either. You know, two billion dollars in market value lost in a matter of minutes, that was an artistic victory, a revelation, not a direct attack so much as a revelation of Dow's tenuous standing given its history of unethical and unsustainable business practices. It was an other position that the social body had as yet been unprepared to accept. Now, uh, the Yes Men also attacked the World Trade Organization and its policies. Well, does that mean the September 11th Al-Qaeda attacks in the World Trade Center were a work of art because they revealed the vulnerability of US hegemony in an increasingly globalized world? Well, a couple artists thought so. Carl Heinz Stockhausen, who recently died, and Damien Hirst, who unfortunately is still alive, thought so. <laughs> Applauding the 9-11 terrorist acts as, quote, the greatest work of art ever. But the revelation produced by the destruction of the Twin Towers took the form of certainty. Whatever confusion immediately ensued, there was nothing curious or intriguing about 2,700 bodies burned and crushed to death. Artists should not be allowed this kind of power, and Stockhausen and Hearst both apologize later for their appalling category error. Likewise, Joe Davis's info gene, that's his E. coli that he bred up there with a picture in it, would cease to be art if his genetic intervention turned E. coli into a vector for anthrax. Indeed, some critics of experimenters like Davis rightly, in my mind, question the accountability of the techniques of genetic engineering, whether in the hands of biotech or, uh, or artists. In contrast, uh, the recent jailing of artist Stephen Kurtz, some of you may know, uh, held without charge on terrorist charges, basically because he had a couple petri dishes in his room, uh, reminds us the importance of protecting artists and their research into avenues that are conceptually dangerous, if not physically so. Even the law eventually came to this conclusion in Kurtz's case, as the authorities had to end up dropping every charge against him except mail fraud. So I think that there's a double-edged sword here, but somehow the two edges seem to kind of balance each other. And as long as we accept that balance, then art will continue to serve us by challenging us. So we've argued so far that the influence of today's art may extend outside the art world and infiltrate court cases, chat rooms, bedrooms. Our current research into connected knowledge suggests that within indigenous cultures, this influence extends even farther into influence over the body, the family, the community, and the ecosystem. That's a particular kind of technological uh, um, reach that our technologies don't necessarily have or not in the same way, but they certainly do reach into that place. Um, yet in both of these cases, we're talking about influence rather than power. We're talking about uh, not damage, but we're talking about revelation. It's very important to maintain that, distant, that distinction. 
Um, right now, if the work that we're looking at is any indication, the work that you've seen, and we've only shown you a couple of examples, there are far more examples in the book, and you can take a look at that, or you can ask us questions about other examples, but there are really, there's a tremendous amount of artistic practice of the kind that we're talking about, and if that's any indication uh, of where we are headed in the future, and it's actually a very interesting indication, in any case, if that's any indication, then we are really on the verge of a transformation from a vertical hierarchy of control, of power, of top-down, to a kind of horizontal uh, web of life. You know, Art on the Edge shows us that whether we make this transition depends on whether or not we can reignite this creative potential of this horizontal movement. We can reignite it in our children, in our students, in our neighbors, in our colleagues, in our community and in all the beings around us, without which our intelligence and our living networks are drastically diminished. We are right now on the edge, and the tipping point is before us. The question is, which way will we lean? Thank you. Couple of questions. Already. That was fast. You want to leave something live flashing and, and jamming <laughs> away up there? Yeah, sure. That, that lady's, uh, or, you know, Get dice and flashing. slice, sure. the, uh, long now sight or something. Um, Jolene, when you started, you mentioned that part of the sort of art environment that's going on is there's less public support of art, at least in North America. In North America. Um, and I can't tell whether you thought that was a good idea or a bad idea. Because uh, you're sort of implying, in, it, in a sense, it's a good idea because it pushes artists out into the world. They go onto the web, which is a very low threshold environment to do stuff where you don't have to you know, build forever. Uh, or they wind up out at Burning Man where they just do it basically for each other and, and it's, uh, it's more in hobby mode in a way. Right. Um, so is a place like Europe, which has a lot more public support of the arts, are, are they uh, over-civilized in this respect? I think that's an interesting debate and discussion, and I think that I would turn to a third alternative for that, not the U.S., uh, which underfunds the art, or Europe, which I don't know if it overfunds the art, but in both, in both cases, the public support for art is coming from large institutions, like governments, like corporations. Basically, it's sort of coming from a top-down anyway. And even if you say, well, they can give money, but they can't, they can't really uh, determine the content of the art. That's left to the artists or the artist organizations themselves. Even in those cases, it really isn't public support for the arts. Um, a better case would be, for example, in uh, Papua New Guinea, where art is created by many more people in the community because they don't have a lot of entertainment to uh, take their time away and, and sort of feed them. They produce art for each other. In fact, in, uh, in New Guinea, they have a form of art called Malangan. It is a production of textile or sculpture. And when you produce this textile or sculpture, what you're really producing is kinship relationships, relationships between people. And so when you talk about public support for the art, you also mean that much of the public is engaged in a kind of art practice of one form or another. And you're producing a little bit more than just objects. You're producing something a little bit more profound. So I think the model that we would look toward is not so much large institutions pouring lots of money into the arts, but a much larger awareness of the importance of arts across the culture and many more people engaging in producing as well as consuming and maybe those producing consuming dichotomies are a little bit problematic anyway but basically involved in the arts would be a much better um, solution I think. Uh, here's a question from Alexander Roser. Did you have a point on that John? Um, except, except maybe to chime in that there was a study recently of uh, 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 the UK gets a lot of um, uh, us American artists salivate when we see the UK because they have so much money flowing the arts. There was a study recently in Scotland that 90% of that money went to administration. Hmm. That, that sounds worthy of some artwork right there. <laughs> <laughs> Alexander Rose's question is, uh, does this mean the reor reorienting of the truth by groups like Fox News is art? <laughs> Actually, this is a really good question, and it's one that I ask my students when I put up the two Dow sites. The sort of, one of my students said, oh, well, digital art is just self-expression using digital tools, isn't it? Like, we're all digital, we're expressing ourselves, and that means we're being creative. 
And I said, okay, let's look, about, let's, let's look at some examples of self-expression. So I said, okay, here's the yes man, and here is, uh, here's, yeah, this is Tao because that's got the ethics on there, and this is the yes man site. Some, sometimes a little bit hard to tell. And I said, are both of these art? They're both kind of self-expression in a certain kind of way, so which of these is art, or are they both art? And the conversation that we had in class was uh, a question of social accountability uh, in some ways, and what the students basically decided once they talked about the HU commercials and that kind of media campaign is they said that, well, this is trying to tell us something, but it's telling us the opposite of what's really going on, and we're not really sure that's art. So that revelation and is so the in fact revelation a, a is really symptom, significant. A symptom that's true of uh, of antibodies, well, and in, in the book. No, no it's wait, wait a minute. Are you saying that artists never lie? Never, never. <laughs> they never lie. <laughs> well, it's. I have they, to fall they, back. they do. There, there is the idea that, that, for example, novelists, which is the field I come from, lie to tell a, a different kind of truth. But the idea is that you're revealing something that we need to know. You're revealing something that we need to to see to understand the world that we live in, rather than hiding things from us. For example. Uh, sort of hiding what is really going on in the Bhopal situation, what is really going on in terms of personal responsibility. The hiding of something uh, is not art, even if what you're showing is an attempt to hide something else. So our, the students concluded that that's not really a form of art. But you may have a different conclusion. In terms of the two of these, um, frankly, I don't find advertisement really tells me much of what I want to know. Um, and I, I, when I see advertisement, I usually apply the 180 degree rule. So for example, my favorite advertisements are car advertisements. Um, because car advertisements show beautiful natural settings, uh, only one car on the road. Uh, usually it's a dirt road and it's, it's quite lovely. The air is clean, there's no global warming. And in fact, cars do the opposite. So if, it seems to me that if you need to advertise, then somehow the word out there isn't very good about you anyway. Otherwise, you wouldn't be spending $5 million trying to say something if your product is already doing it. So I, don't, I, I have a real problem with advertising in that it doesn't work for me. I don't, I don't find that it works for me. Um, no, I don't. At, let's look at uh, Mr. Toscani here. I don't. Um, let me see if I can bring I haven't seen advertisement that, that does that for me. Photoshop curse. But maybe there is some. I haven't seen it yet. Bravia? Um, I haven't seen it. I've seen it. And um, it's, uh, okay, let's, one step at a time. This is a photograph by Oliviero Toscani, the Benetton photographer well known for promulgating the United Colors of Benetton campaign. What most people, especially in America for some reason, don't know is that um, his campaign was always gritty in one way or another. Yes, you may know the sort of um, you know, multiracial people kissing on the sides of buses, but you might not know about the beef hearts labeled uh, white, black, yellow, or the bloody uh, Yugoslavian uniform, and so forth. And we're talking about these uh, literally, you know, in billboards on the street and so forth. Here is one of the few people, I think, who've managed to make an inroad into uh, advertising and turn it into a form of art. Mm -hmm. uh, but you followed up with something, Kevin, about the... But of course, this has, this has nothing to do with his clothes. It has nothing to do with Benetton clothes, right? Which, of course, you know, again, it has nothing to do... If I'm interested in buying clothes from Benetton, this is not telling me anything about the clothes. For example, where it's made, who's making it, how old the kids are who are making it, if it's kids, uh, where the products come from, is it organic or not, you know, all these kinds of things that I really want to know about the products I'm buying, I don't really find out from advertisements. So maybe that's why advertisement doesn't interest me, that what it, information it's giving me is not what I want to know. Now, maybe advertisement is doing something different than telling me something about well, the product, as this does. Let me step into that one, because one of the things I got from hanging out with Brian Eno, who's talked a couple of times in the series, is that yeah, art is about society, which is what you guys have been mainly working on tonight, but also art is about art. And artists are always intensely aware of you know, a, a dialogue or argument they're having with either their predecessors or their contemporaries. Sure. And Part of what makes advertising work as a medium is that a lot of advertising is about advertising. And it assumes yeah. the knowledge in the audience of nuances and jokes and references and all this kind of stuff, which 
is very similar to the kind of things that you know, Andy Warhol is doing when he's referring to all of his predecessors. Sure. So that kind of dialogue, that very nuanced, fashion-oriented, uh, sophisticated dialogue, is part of the same story of society checking out new ways to think about things at the edge of how subtle can you be. Does that make sense? But I think there's also been sure. a break, and it's, it's a break that we're trying to mark with our, our book and our thinking here. Uh, in, in the 20th century, this solipsism became so extreme that mm. art became about itself uh, very quickly, and there was really, you know, there had artists like Joseph Kosuth, who, uh, whatever, 69, wrote something called Art After, Art After Philosophy, in which he claimed that all art was essentially about itself, uh, and every piece of art was a new definition of art. And that was fine for a while, but uh, w what happened is that all of those inbred references became so arcane that you had to, you know, go around to galleries in uh, Chelsea every uh, few weeks in order to understand a particular image. And I think what we're looking at is the explosion of art outside of that white cube, outside of that restricted kind of nursery, if you will. So that, yeah, there are references to culture there, but when you see the Star Wars movie of DCSS code, uh, it's a lot more people that get that one than get that, you know, Warhol was making a reference to Basquiat, who was making a reference to Kossuth. Now, every kind of performer calls themselves an artist. I mean, the singer, mm. the country and western singer, I mean, this is the artist. Except the artist. for the one formerly known at, no, never mind. Okay. <laughs> uh, who got his name back, I think. And now he's formerly known as the artist. Because oh, well, he, he was called the artist for a while. It sounds like part of what you guys are probing around for here is people who don't even know they're artists. Right. And don't think of themselves as artists, exactly. but are doing what you consider to be an art function in the world. Is right. that correct? That's a good part of what we discovered when we were looking online and we were looking offline and we were looking at creative activity, is that a lot of people who we thought were artists didn't think of themselves as, and were not working in traditional art venues. Does a bad thing happen if you call them an artist? Do they get self-conscious <laughs> and weird? <laughs> Not, everybody's is it, as comfortable. Not everyone is comfortable with the term as we are, mm -hmm. uh, as we mentioned. I mean, the, the whole question that we had to begin with is whether art was even useful at all as a category, whether we should continue to use the word, whether people should continue to practice art, what it was about. Um, these were some of the questions that first informed our work, and we saw that there was a great uh, sort of uneasiness among artists, largely because art had become so emasculated. When it's only talking about itself, it's not doing anything in the world, and therefore they're not interested. Mm -hmm. And that's what we discovered. And we were interested in the kind of art that is not talking about itself, but talking about the world that we live in. Uh, because our world is really in a kind of a precarious position right now, and talking, you know, a, a, talking within a white cube is not going to help us get out of it, according to some of the people that we're looking, you know, whose work we're looking at. Yeah, I noticed that... Um and the news today was that they got some glow-in-the-dark cats in uh, Korea, which are going to be used for genetic uh, research, which is great. As I recall, there was an artist about 10 years ago who made some glow-in-the-dark fish, yeah, which right. uh, are illegal in California, <laughs> uh, for no good reason. But anyway, I'm sure you can go to Nevada and get a glow-in-the-dark fish and sneak it across the border. Uh, but this is a nice case of, in a sense, yeah. You know, an artist really, really jamming ahead without anybody's permission and doing the things that all my fellow environmentalists knew was profoundly evil mm. and dangerous and was probably bad for the fish and, mm. and, 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 and just went out and did it and put it out there and I guess you can buy these fish uh, and they freaked out the Californians, that's usually worth doing. Uh, <laughs> and now when the, when the glow-in-the-dark cats come along, we're kind of ready for them. Mm. Mm. Well, <laughs> the artist that you're talking about is uh, Eduardo Koch. Aha! And, um, what do you know about him? Because I know this is real hearsay. I'm well, okay. Uh, where to start with that one? Um, Eduardo, let's see, I think I have an image of him around here somewhere. One of these was his. Oh no, antibody. There we go. So this is Eduardo Koch's installation, um, Genesis. Ooh. Uh, which is shown, um, I think, at ISEA 2006 was the most recent uh, exhibition nearby. Uh, I'm, I might be wrong about that. It was also shown in Montreal. It's been shown all over the world. Um, it is a series of, um, of uh, bacteria that have been encoded with the phrase, let man have dominion over the birds and beasts. In other words, the, the, hmm. the very beginning, or one of the beginning phrases from uh, the Bible. And... Um, 
uh, Koch has made a career out of uh, tickling the fancies of, 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 uh, of gallery goers and of um, you know, newspapers and reporters and so forth. Uh, but ultimately, I think you have to ask how, how deep that uh, investigation is mm -hmm. and whether it's simply um, uh, provoking for the sake of provoking or whether there's something more that's revealed in the process. And wow. there are, there I are it's folks, hard to tell the difference. Well, sometimes it is, but that's what, uh, to me, makes the difference between a good artwork and a bad artwork. We may be de defining art differently than we've defined it in the 20th century, but that doesn't mean, in my mind, that there is a difference between good and bad. Well, now, this particular installation looks rather gorgeous. Uh, is, that, is it for what? Pull up uh, Darko Maver. Darko Maver. Oh, okay. Is it okay if it's beautiful? Ah, another question. I'll let Jolene hit it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we have debates about this. I think beauty is very important. I why? think it's critical. Um, I don't know why. I, don't, I, I, I think that many of us respond to beauty uh, and different forms of beauty um, all the time in our lives. I don't think it's very, been very well articulated. Even the sort of history of aesthetics doesn't talk about it in a way that makes sense to me. Um, but I do think that we respond to beauty. I don't think necessarily that when my students are trying to paint beautiful pictures that their, that their sense of beauty is very well developed. I think that beauty always surprises us. For example, I look to nature as an example often when I'm trying to figure these things out. And in nature, I see beautiful things and they're almost always unexpected. I can't tell what it's going to be until I see it. And when I see it, something remarkable happens. Whereas in a media world, what is beautiful is often foretold. For example, what a beautiful woman looks like is often scripted by all the media images of what a beautiful woman, woman should look like. So if she's too overweight, she's not beautiful. If she's too tall, she's not, all these things. So media scripts our sense of beauty so much over and over again, and so does art, that it's hard to really get that sense of like, Awe that we but feel But that must in be loosening setting. with this bottom-up uh, web that we're in the thick of. Where it's so you know, uh, mainstream media are struggling to keep up with all of the weirdness which is uh, percolating up out of this uh, trillions of antibodies, yeah. and presumably uh, agreed-on ideas of beauty are one of the things that get lost in that process. Yes. Well, I think that's sort of true, but I, yeah, I, I also don't know. think I don't know. For example, that our book has a lot of images of things that are beautiful. However, it was important to us that it was a beautiful book. <laughs> that's Good. because that's you know, an aspect I mean, of because design. That, because <laughs> aesthetics matters to me, but I, I don't think that that's the only thing that matters to me in looking at art. I don't think it's the only criteria. Mm -hmm. And I, don't, I think that, for example, for example, I think that nature does beauty a lot better than artists do in most cases. I just think that, you know, some vistas, uh, some, you know, sometimes it's, it's small things on the ground, sometimes, I live in Maine, I live by a lake. Every time I wake up and the sun hits the trees and the snow or the grass differently, it's gorgeous, it's beautiful, it's unexpected, and I've never seen any painting that does it justice, or any photograph, or anything that, that does the sort of play justice. Let me just give you one reason why, because nature is profoundly interactive. Okay, this media is interactive. Maybe we hear, maybe we touch, maybe we see, but we don't taste this stuff. We don't enter into it. It's not three-dimensional. I mean, we try, I mean, nature has such a communication with us. It's so interactive, and it's so constantly moving and changing that the depth of an experience in nature is much deeper. And so if you, for example, look at um, recent research that's come out, for example, Last Child in the Woods, suggests that human beings, young people, children who don't have enough contact with nature end up with all kinds of severe social problems, end up disconnected, end up with um, um, really not as intelligent because their intelligence isn't as stimulated as it is by these technologies as it is by the natural world. So the intelligence that I'm talking about, which is networked, is not just networked with other human beings. It's networked with other beings of all kinds with trees, with birds, with rocks, with water. These are all beings that you can communicate with. And some cultures still know how to do that. When I went back to Maine, I told my children, we don't know how to do that. All the animals here, the rocks, the trees, think we're dumb because we no longer talk to them. We only talk to ourselves. When we're talking about the white box of art, and humans talking to themselves, and art talking about art, we're talking about that kind of inbred autoimmune problem that we don't really seek otherness anymore and we can't communicate with it and it doesn't communicate to us. 
But having been in Maine for a while, I can tell you tree stories, if you ask me, about communication between humans and non-humans, which is what the shaman always does on the edges of their own cultures. So I think the communication, the interactivity we need is much deeper than what this stuff promises as interactivity. Well, you will now go out and run around the block and continue. <laughs> Right here. Well, let me end with a properly dangerous question, since uh, danger is what this is all about. Um, you guys have been married how long? Never. <laughs> Not? Great. Never yeah. married. You've been parents for how long? How long? Oh, going on 10 years. 10 years. 10 years, okay. Uh, what I'd love to know is, on the subject of tonight, what do you guys have disagreements about? And how do you manage those disagreements? Mm, how much time do we have left? <laughs> it, it, you know, couplehood is a paradox. You're always playing against the, that uh, you're absolutely one and you're absolutely not one. And uh, when you're probing deep, like you're trying to do with understanding art here, uh, you must be going in and out of agreement and disagreement on a number of things. <laughs> John first. No, She's I, thinking. <laughs> Uh, ironically, I think that it's the uh, the collaboration on something intellectual or, or aesthetic like the like this you know book and so forth. Our research is the easiest part of mm -hmm. our relationship. Like the hardest part is you know I'm working on the QWERTY keyboard and Jillian's like, okay, we're gonna learn the Dvorak keyboard. We are <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I spent a summer learning the Dvorak keyboard. You have to see my uh, computer. I'm it's got the Dvorak uh, little tabs on yeah. it because. Uh, I so anyway, so then you know, a few months later, I'm going back to the QWERTY keyboard. Uh, we are. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and and then I that, that. pales that pales uh, in in comparison to the struggles of um, of raising children together. And um, <laughs> we, we, I think that any parents who really are both engaged in that process um, have the hardest time because somehow we expect two people alone, disconnected from the rest of society with grandparents in different time zones to somehow work out how to raise uh, rear children together. And we make it a little harder for ourselves by eliminating some of those, um, those, those conveniences of television and video games and these other forms of interactivity that are perhaps less uh, immediately useful to children. We don't religiously I, forbid I them. tried to turn on the TV this morning while we were finishing up this presentation so my kids could watch TV for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, and my son said, oh, do we have to watch TV? And, and this is I someone who, turn it off. we don't have a TV at home, so this was supposed to be his big thrill to big go thrill. to San Francisco where they have TV, <laughs> right? Not in Maine where we have a lake. But, um, my, my son is also very interested in advertisement. He mimics it wherever he can. He's got a really big kick about Coca-Cola and McDonald's. Um, and that's because when we first went to Maine, we, my son was four, my daughter was two. We stopped at a McDonald's right near a Friendly's. We went into the Friendly's and didn't go into the McDonald's. And my son said, he's four, what's that? Why does it have a big M? What's going on there? And John turned around and said, oh, we're going into Friendly's. That's Meanies. All the people, that big M you see? All the people there are really mean, the food's really lousy, they're very rude. And because my son never eats fast food for a year and a half in Maine, he believed that. And then one day, he, he, he had a play date and they took him to uh, McDonald's. <laughs> and uh, he came home and he said, uh, Gooish, I'm not mom, I'm Gooish. Um, Gooish, um, I went to McDonald's today. And I said, well, yeah, how was it? He's like, well, they weren't really that mean. <laughs> And he said, and I ate some french fries. I said, well, how were they? He said, well, they were okay, but I didn't eat the hamburgers. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he's kind of still struggling with that, with that whole thing as well. Um, I want to say just about one thing that we're struggling with, and that is that co-parenting. Has anyone ever tried co-parenting? We started 50, off, well, 49, we sort of share, 51%. like, um, we started off equals. We were together 17 years before having children. So this was a great big bomb. I think Adrian Rich said having children is a time bomb in a relationship. It is. Um, <laughs> um, trying to parent equally is really very difficult. Um, and I realize that the reason they have gender roles is so, you, so that you don't have turf wars. And I've been studying animals. It's true. I've been studying animals and animal sort of uh, um, arrangements. Like, for example, wolves have really interesting animal arrangements. And uh, it turns out that they actually separate different turfs to reduce the amount of turf wars they have. So that having different turf, not necessarily gender roles specifically, but having different turfs is very good. So I think in the general question of couples and getting along, 
one of the major insights recently is separate our turfs and not, don't overlap too much. And this book was a major overlap. Yeah. Major. So you had to balance that with a fair amount of independence. <laughs> you have to know where your edges are. Yeah, really. Yes. Well, anything else? I want to finish up with anything or call it a night? Well, there was a question I think that Kevin had raised earlier in the night that mm -hmm. was, about, was about something about what, what brand of art makes the most creative stew. And um, am I right in thinking we all decided it was a stew art brand? <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> well done.